Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Krista Thomason, who is a professor of philosophy at Swarthmore University, also the author of uh, Swarthmore College. Books. Swarthmore Sorry. College. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and um, also the author of a couple of books. This one called uh, Dancing with the Devil. I mean, look at look at the cover. Um, this is <laughs> this is a great cover. Why bad feelings make life good. And uh, the older book is called um, Naked: um, The Dark Side of Shame and Moral Life. Although I, I guess you could have titled it the the bright side and the dark side. Of yeah, in some sense. And more yeah. life. Yeah. Welcome, Krista. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you, you point out in the beginning of this new book that um, emotions have been a subject of study for of philosophers ever since, you know, we've had philosophy, right? And, you know, they are in part to, to blame, I guess, for this dichotomy between head and and heart i mean you, you point to the romantics as the folks who kind of popularized this distinction but i mean it seems like the the philosophers have been doing this ever since they started philosophizing and and so you know philosophers generally take a, a dim view of emotions at least that's been been my understanding of most philosophers and, and i guess the question is you know why is that why, why don't we have philosophers equally represented on, on on both sides of of this debate about the merits of emotions as a source of insight and, and knowledge. Well, what's funny about that is I think that's a bit of a misconception, actually. So there are definitely philosophers who believe in the emotion reason divide. Uh, that is, you know, absolutely the case. There are people like I would say Spinoza is on that list, and I would say the Stoics are probably on that list. But uh, the thing that I, you know, really loved about working on this book was was actually looking back and realizing that that dichotomy that we've created where we have this idea that like philosophy is somehow responsible for the reason emotion divide is I think overstated. I think there are lots of there's a really wide range of positions about what emotions are, how they function and what their value is in the history of philosophy, I think more so than people realize. So you have people like, you know, the British sentimentalist tradition, or you have people like Francis Hutcheson and David Hume and Adam Smith, who actually thought, you know, passions were extremely important to our everyday lives, including our moral lives. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of a, they, I think philosophers get a bad rap about this, uh, that they're sort of partially responsible for the reason emotion divide. Um, there is a tradition of philosophy, definitely, that sees emotions, particularly negative emotions, as troublemakers. They are either sort of fundamentally irrational, um, they are like um, evil forces that overtake us or possess us. And, you know, as much as they might have also thought that that was true, uh, I think that view is is still pretty popular, I think, among people these days. I think particularly when it comes to negative emotions, I think people still have a little bit of a sense that, you know, if you're not careful, uh, emotions like anger or jealousy are going to sort of take over your mind. Um, so it's I think we've adopted at least some of that from from some of the traditions in philosophy. I'm going to halt you right now and just ask you, maybe take the, the, the microphone and push it, bend it a little bit further away from sure. your mouth because you're getting a little bit of the p -p 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 oh, okay. thing. So let me let me try, try and put it down this. here. Maybe that's better. Yeah, go, go, uh, say something like, uh, <laughs> philosophy. Philosophy. <laughs> okay, there we go. Is that better? Much, okay. Yeah, yeah, I can just yeah, move much, it down. Yeah. Much better. So, you know, one of the metaphors that you use in the book uh, a lot is this idea of, you know, life as as a garden, right? <laughs> and um, I guess some people would say that these um, emotions, or at least the negative emotions, and, and you talk a lot about kind of the, the kind of um, double standard, right, where we view positive emotions and negative emotions differently. But when we think about the negative emotions, you, you talk about, some people talk about them as, as the weeds, and you say maybe we should think about them more like the the worms. And and I guess you got this from from Nietzsche, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's the one that came up with this worms idea. 
Uh, he partly did. He came up with the the idea of sort of like the worms in the soul. But funny enough, I got that metaphor mostly from contemporary work. So if you read uh, articles about, uh, you know, self-help and how to deal with negative emotions, it's very, very common for people to use the garden metaphor and use the weed metaphor and talk about negative emotions as though they're weeds and they're things that we have to either manage or pull up or do something with. Otherwise, they're going to sort of take over and, and spoil the place. So there were there was lots of uh, lots of garden metaphors came up in, in the work that I was doing in the book. Like some of it comes from Alexander Pope. Some of it comes from Montaigne. But yeah, the worms mostly came from Nietzsche. Right. And so this dual standard between double standard between the way we treat positive and negative emotions, I mean, that means that that that, that view presumably does not see emotions as a source of information or a source of 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 insight, right? And the, the alternative view is that emotions are important guides to help us understand the world and also to understand who we are, right? And not simply just affects that are pleasurable or, or unpleasurable, right? I mean, how could you not think that emotions are a, a source of information? I mean, isn't that why they exist in, in the first place? I think that's, I mean, I think that's right. I do think people tend to have, they tend to have that view much more uh, prevalently with positive emotions. So I think, you know, I, my joke is always, you will hear people say, oh, find joy in the little things, but you rarely hear people say, find anger in the little things. So I think I think we have this tendency to think that positive emotions are good, um, uh, helpful things in our lives, that they're sources of information. But the negative emotions are somehow built on false beliefs. They are fundamentally irrational. Um, they are seeing the world in the wrong sorts of ways, whereas po positive emotions are sort of seeing the world in the right sorts of ways. And so if we're going to pay attention to our emotions, then we're supposed to pay attention to the ones that sort of have the real knowledge. And we make the assumption that the positive emotions are the the ones that have that. Now, not everybody thinks that. I mean, there are people who would say, no, negative emotions have their own um, kind of knowledge too. They have their own kinds of insights that are that are attached to them. Then you get uh, uh, different ways of understanding what that means. And so uh, I think one of the one of the moves that people sometimes make with negative emotions is to say, right, they have a certain kind of insight or a certain kind of knowledge, um, and we need to figure out how to sort of channel them, use them as fuel, make them productive. Uh, that's the part that I sort of want to resist a little bit, um, because I think we, we're we pretty keen to sort of think, oh, yes, it's fine for you to feel anger as long as you do something mm -hmm. healthy or productive with it. Uh, and only then is it going to be okay. Um, and I, I think I kind of want to resist. I want to sort of ask people, why are we so uh, sure that we need to make our emotions productive? Like, why are they the sorts of things <laughs> that need to be made into a productive feeling? Well, look, I mean, it would be hard to deny the notion that things like fear help you to, you know, learn about danger, right? And pleasure helps you to learn about things that are good for you. But I think you highlight how these emotions don't just sort of help you to, you know, learn about things that are good and bad for you, but they help you to learn about what's important to you, right? Mm -hmm. And help you to learn about your, your com commitments and, and the things that make you who you are. I mean, that seems like a much, much deeper and, and more Im important reason why we should pay attention to emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we sometimes want to, when we talk about emotions, we sometimes want to think about what are their benefits or what are their payoffs, right? That they have to have some kind of tangible, there's some sort of tangible result that comes from them. So fear is good because, well, without it, we wouldn't know we were in danger. And it's not as though that's false, but I think there is a, a, a deeper story to tell about what's the relationship between ourselves and our emotions. So philosophers have a, have for a long time essentially made the argument that, that emotions are ways of caring about things. If you're committed to something, if you're invested in something, you're going to feel about it. And 
understanding and paying attention to your emotions is sort of part of self-discovery. It's part of figuring out what are these things that matter to me. And sometimes your emotions will show what you're invested in and what matters to you, maybe before you sort of fully realize it yourself. So there's this way that they can kind of point us in certain sorts of directions, help us learn things about ourselves that we may not initially realize. So in other words, if you, if you take this view that you, you need to master your, your emotions, then that presupposes that you know what what they're for or what you're for, right? Exactly. So whereas the, if, you, if you don't really know, then you need to listen to the emotions to figure out what it is that is important to you. Exactly, exactly right. Now, you introduced this idea of the uh, emotional saint, right? <laughs> and it's, I mean, we all know about moral saints, but, but uh, I, I'd never heard this phrase emotional saint before and it's it's very powerful right as an as an idea and you talk about kind of two different groups of emotional saints and the the first one i think i mean these, this is i think it's easy to see the problem with the the first first group at least it was easier for me to see the problem even though all of us are tempted to fall into that trap the the second group however that includes confucius and, and aristotle i mean it's it's a lot harder to see the problem with what they're advocating, which is, you know, to cultivate, uh, um, you know, emotional maturity, let's say. Mm -hmm. So maybe start off, like, how did you come up with this idea of the, the emotional saint? And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, right, I mean, I love the, 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 the piece by Orwell, right, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, which uh, kicks off that section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the emotional saint has origins in, in two places. One in a famous paper by Susan Wolf called Moral Saints. So partly it's a, it's an homage to her to her kind of concept of, of a moral saint. But it also comes from Nietzsche, who has a, a similar sort of, um, Nietzsche has a series of archetypes that he sometimes talks about in his work. And the saint is kind of like one of the archetypes that he talks about. So it's a combination of those two things. Um, I think emotional sainthood is a pretty powerful ideal, probably more powerful than people often realize. Um, it's everywhere in the history of philosophy, but it's around us too. Uh, the basic idea is that we'd be better off, right? The emotional saint is a person who thinks we'd be better off if we felt fewer or no negative emotions. And then there's sort of different ways of understanding how that plays out. The, the first type, the emotional saints, the controlled emotion saints, these are the more sort of extreme versions of the emotional saints. They're the ones who think, you know, it's going to be really difficult, but all things considered, it would be better if we just tried to get over our negative emotions completely. Uh, they're, they don't have any value. They're basically irrational. They're just, all they do is cause trouble and we would just be better off without them. And, and this is a view of Seneca and, and mm -hmm. the Stoics, right? Yeah, I think the Stoics are very much in this camp. I think Gandhi is partially in this camp, thanks to the Orwell essay. Um, they think that uh, negative emotions happen because you have false beliefs about how the world works. And so in that sense, they're fundamentally irrational. They contain no insight and all they do is cause trouble. So given that, better that we get better that we just get over them completely. So that's a hard pill, I think, for a lot of people to swallow, even if they are tempted toward the idea, even if they sort of agree. I think some people think, yeah, but that's just asking way too much. There's just no way we can really get over our negative emotions. And I think some people are sort of tempted to say, well, look, aren't there times when negative emotions are helpful and insightful? I mean, aren't there times when you should be angry, for example, if somebody mistreats you? Given that, I think people People are a little bit more willing to accept a different version of emotional sainthood, the one that I associate with Confucius and Aristotle, which is cultivated emotional sainthood. So they will say, listen, you don't have to get rid of your negative emotions. That's too much. All you have to do is train them in the right kinds of ways. And if you train them in the right kinds of ways, then they'll behave and then they won't be troublemakers. And then we can get all of the benefits from them without having the downsides. So that's the part where I think this issue of self-discovery becomes really important. I think the cultivated emotion saints are the people who think, well, you still have to be the one that's in charge, right? And so you are the one when if there's a if there's a disagreement between your rational judgment and your feeling, you've got to figure out how to navigate that disagreement. And your feeling is probably the one that's wrong. And I think if emotions are going to play this role of self-discovery, 
you can't automatically assume that if there's a conflict between reason and emotion or judgment and emotion, that the emotion is the one that's got to behave, that the emotion is the one that has to fall in line. It could be that your emotions are telling you things that you yourself may not be ready to admit. So my favorite example of this is imagine you're going to work and you're miserable every day, you're restless, you snap at people, you dread getting up in the morning. And after a while, it sort of dawns on you, you know what? I never wanted to be this. I never wanted to be a lawyer, let's say, right? right? I just was, I became a lawyer because my dad was a lawyer and my granddad was a lawyer. And that was just what everybody did. And at no point did I actually think, do I want this for myself? And this was like a slow realization that I had to have. But it was that, it, were, it was the negative feelings that I had that sort of like gave me the inkling that something might be wrong. So I think if emotions are going to play that role in our lives, we got to let them have a longer leash. And that's, I think, something that the cultivated emotion saints are, are unwilling to do. So that's saying that if we had kind of suppressed that in some way, whether pharmacologically or, or through stoic discipline, um, then we would never have learned that this job is not what we want to do, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, so it's like it's like turning off your altimeter or yeah. you know, turning off your right. But I mean, but it's hard to argue that you shouldn't kind of I don't know, discipline emotions in some way, right? I mean, you use the example of someone who's um on a plane, right? And and they they they're afraid to fly. Okay. And you know, I've known people like this and they're terrified of jumping, you know, getting in the plane and they think it's going to crash. And, and you say, but look, right. I mean, look at the statistics. The most dangerous part of the journey is already done drive into the airport. Like, you know, you shouldn't have anything to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if our emotions are in fact, um, sensors and classifiers, right. I like to think of them as classifiers, mm -hmm. right. They're, then there are false positives and, and mm -hmm. false negatives. Shouldn't mm -hmm. we go back and, kind of periodically adjust the sensitivity of our uh, fire smoke detectors. <laughs> when, <laughs> right. when we know like, hey, okay, fine, I'll, I'll let it go off. But then once mm -hmm. I've verified that there's no fire, mm -hmm. shouldn't I hit the, the button to kind of turn it off at some point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't necessarily want to make the argument that your emotions are never wrong, right? I mean, they they're just like any other part of your psychology. And sometimes they don't quite get what's going on, right? Um, they are, they're a little bit different though. I like to sort of make the analogy between them and perceptions. So look, if I look outside and I think I see a squirrel in the tree, but it turns out it's just a you know pile of leaves or whatever. Okay, well then my perception is wrong. There's not actually a squirrel in the tree. Okay. Emotions sometimes work like that. I think there's an axe murderer in the woods. Turns out not a real axe murderer. It's just a plywood cut out of a you know, haunted house or something like that. Um, okay, in some sense, my emotions are wrong about that. But my emotions are also a little bit unlike perceptions in the sense that they tell me how I am experiencing a situation. How I am experiencing a situation sometimes admits of a kind of accuracy, but sometimes it doesn't. So my mother-in-law is a perfect example of this because she is also afraid of flying. She is not actually so much afraid of the plane crashing. So like all the statistics in the world about plane crashes are not actually going to address her fear. She's afraid of heights and she's a little bit claustrophobic. So you can imagine someone who knows they're very high up in the air. It's true. You are indeed very high up in the air when you are in a plane. And if you're a little bit claustrophobic, you might be afraid of flying, not because you're afraid of the plane crashing, but because there's something else your fear is tracking. So I'm of the view that your emotions have a pretty broad range of things that they might be tracking. And we're oftentimes very bad about kind of like rushing in and policing people's feelings without actually first trying to understand whether or not they're picking up on something that might be like a little bit outside of the bounds of whatever the normal fear is of flying. So I tend to think that's that longer leash that I want to sort of talk about and say, well, you know, yeah, it's not that you're feelings are always right but let's sort of let's let's kind of rein in our desire to kind of police people's feelings all of the time and let's explore them first before we start making corrections well that means that there is still a role for i guess um 
reason when it comes to interpreting uh, yeah. the emotions, right? You know, I'll, I'll sometimes, you know, I'll have friends and loved ones that'll just start, you know, yelling at me for something. And, and I'll say, look, you're not angry at me. You're angry at the fact that there's only 24 hours in a day, right? You know, you're angry at the fact that, that, you know, that, that, um, it's, it's raining out, right? But, you know, or, you know, that you're hungry, but you're not really angry at me. So wh why are you interpreting this anger as, you know, as I'm the problem, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, so are you saying that there, there is, there is a difference between sort of suppressing it and ignoring it and maybe um, doing the hard work of teasing out what's, what's really going on? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm very much in favor of doing the hard work of sort of teasing out what's going on. And, and not that's not always gonna translate into um, uh, trying to sort of find reasons for or justifying how we feel. You know what, there are going to be times where I feel a certain way. I don't know why. I've gone through what I think might be going on, what I think might be the reasons, or maybe my feelings have surprised me in such a way that I thought, you know, oh, I didn't think I was going to think this was a big deal, but actually I do kind of think it's a big deal. And and that's actually surprising to me. I didn't realize I was going to be this afraid, or I didn't realize I was going to be this angry about this particular thing. Um, I don't think that there is some sort of like master list somewhere that says, this is precisely how much anger you're permitted to feel about this particular thing. And I think when we get upset about people like overreacting, for example, or lashing out at something else, I think what we're mostly um, concerned about is uh, what I'd like to sometimes term emotional maturity. So that doesn't have to mean, emotional maturity doesn't have to mean reason controls the emotions. Emotional maturity can mean I am good at identifying what I'm feeling. I'm good at accepting that, you know, this is how I feel about something. And I'm also good at recognizing that this is how I am experiencing this situation that may or may not be reflecting how the situation actually is, but also I'm good at just feeling my emotions without necessarily feeling like I have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So I can be angry that there's a really long line in the coffee shop and people are sort of taking too long in front of me and I'm irritated about that. I can feel that way without then saying it's somebody's fault. You guys need to hurry up, come on, or lashing out or saying something or making some kind of snide comment. It's fine for you to feel angry and feel frustrated about the situation without then turning it into something else. And I think that's part of that's part of emotional maturity, but that doesn't have to mean, oh, I'm conquering my anger with reason. Well, this reminds me, I, I, I heard recently uh, an interpretation of Mr. Rogers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I don't know if you saw this, but Mr. Rogers is a, a philosophy of educating kids was there's no such thing as a bad feeling. Right. There are only kind of bad actions that you mm -hmm. can take in, in response to those feelings. But mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of philosophers and psychologists define emotions as sort of, you know, action preparation. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, anger isn't a feeling. Anger is a, uh, a mechanism that gears you up towards mm -hmm. some kind of act of, you know, vengeance, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, if, if the feeling itself has an implied action, how does it make sense to kind of split them up and, mm -hmm. and think about them differently? Yeah, this is the part where I just have to say I disagree with sort of the, the action tendency view of emotions. And I think one of the reasons I disagree with them is because it's got to that that view sort of presupposes that there's some identifiable kind of set of actions that kind of makes sense in terms of what anger is going to do or like what anger prepares you for. And what I think that I think oftentimes what happens is we take what is common and we sort of treat it as necessary. And I think that's that's just not the case. There are a number of different ways that people can respond to their emotions. And 
I think it once you start ex exploring the cases a little bit better, it's a little bit harder to generalize and say this is the action that's sort of associated with this emotion. There's a number of different actions that are associated with a variety of emotions. We're we're interesting creatures insofar as we do a lot of different kinds of stuff with our feelings. So I just tend to be on the side of, of folks who just think that I, I want to emphasize the feeling part of the emotion and less so the action part of the emotion. There's a bunch of different stuff we can do with our emotions. I also think we have a tendency to conflate um, how we often respond to a feeling with that being sort of a necessary part of the feeling. So it's very common for people to lash out in anger. I don't think that makes lashing out necessary to anger. It's not sort of like part of the definition of anger. It is, I think, a very common way we react. I, I call it, you know, I just use the old term of coping mechanism. Anger is a powerful feeling that we don't always know what to do with when we experience it. And so I think we have a tendency to want to try to turn our emotions into actions because we don't really know how to just sort of sit and feel. We're quite bad at that, I think. Um, we're not, I just think we're not particularly well equipped to sort of just sit and feel something, particularly something that feels unpleasant. And so oftentimes we reach for these kinds of common coping mechanisms as a way to cope with that, the the sort of like bigness of the feeling. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I understood you to be saying that lashing out is equivalent to kind of suppressing emotions and that both of them are kind of ways of just trying to get get rid of it yeah absolutely. rather than to sit with it mm -hmm, absolutely when you when you lash out it's a way of just sort of passing it passing the pain right like yes. Owen flanagan's thing where you right. say okay you know I, I i feel stress i'll stress you out and that's exactly. going to get rid of my stress right exactly that's exactly right yeah it's just another way of trying not to feel the thing yeah absolutely mm -hmm. now some people would say okay fine emotions are great but it's it's really all about moderation, you know, moderation yeah. in all things, right? So this yeah, is right. the Aristotelian view. It's <laughs> right, like, yeah, right, right, great. Right. Just don't have too much of it, right? Sure, you know, contempt sure, sure. is fine. Just yeah. don't have so much of it, mm -hmm, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what what's wrong with that view? Yeah, I I think that the I think we are um, really wrapped up, particularly in I think our contemporary discourse, especially we're really wrapped up in whatever we take to be the appropriate amount of of feeling that we're supposed to have. So I remember the the thing that I think um, really stands out for me, a really clear memory I have for me about this is when Ronald Reagan died and they televised the natural the, the funeral. And I remember people talking about how great it was that Nancy Reagan sort of didn't show any really strong emotions, that she was very composed. And people were so praised, they were so praiseworthy of her for being so composed. And I remember thinking, her spouse just died. Like the person that she's been with forever and ever. What would have been so wrong about a public display of devastation, which she no doubt was feeling, or at least I can imagine her feeling that way? Why are we so praiseworthy of someone who sort of doesn't fall apart, especially at a moment where you think, but it would be so normal to fall apart. It would be completely intelligible to fall apart. In fact, dare I say it would be appropriate to fall apart when the love of your life has died. Um, so I think we are weirdly skeptical or suspicious of sort of strong displays of emotion in a way that I don't think we ought to be. Because why is it not the case that your emotional life should reflect the things that go on in your actual life? And when your world falls apart, why is it not okay for you to fall apart also? Yeah, I mean, part of the, the consequence of suppressing these emotions is that you train yourself not to care, right? Yeah. I mean, and and I think you know, at least in in Buddhist philosophy, that's considered a, a virtue. I, I I I've always had problem with that, right? I mean, not caring means not caring. I mean, right. <laughs> why would we want people to not care, particularly about? other people or, yeah. you know, loved ones. Um, I think, mm -hmm. you, you know, in the Stoic um, philosophy, there's, I think, was it Seneca who said, you know, when you kiss your child. You oh, know, Epictetus, good old Epictetus. Epictetus. Yeah. Go mm -hmm. back to the, yeah, go back mm -hmm. to the, to the, to the beginning, right? Epictetus mm -hmm. sort of said, you know, your, your, your kid's going to live or die and 
that's just the way it is. I mean, that's right. Gosh, would you want a parent like that? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> right. Or would you want a, yeah. would you want a partner who never gets jealous? I mean, right. that, that would be uh, mm-hmm. wonder whether they really care about you. Yeah. And that's the thing with both sort of the Stoics and the Buddhists is that's kind of what makes them the sort of emotional saints that they are is they're what they're really asking for. And I think people tend to downplay this about them. I think what they're really asking is for people to have a really fundamental reorientation toward their lives. You have to really see your life in the world in a very different kind of way in order to get to the psychological place that they're asking you to get to. You really have to sort of see your wife and child, as Epictetus is going to put it, those are people who who will die. And so I can't get too attached to them because, you know, luck and the and the vagaries of life are going to are going to hit me. And, you know, I can't I, if I invest too much in these people, then it's going to devastate me when they die. And so better to not be invested. Yeah. And that's that's a, just a fundamental disagreement that I have with them about what a good human life is supposed to look like. That it's not one where we try to detach ourselves and it's one where we are invested. And if that comes at the cost of having negative emotions, then that's a cost I think we should be willing to pay. It's better to be fully invested in your life, your boring old human life, and see it as meaningful and take the negative emotions that come along with it rather than try to kind of keep it at arm's length just so you can have this kind of inner mental peace. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, all the emotions that you discuss in, in this book and in the other book, these are emotions that flow from your relationships, right? And your interactions with, with other people, right? So whether it's, you know, envy or jealousy, spite, schadenfreude, right, shame. I mean, these are all social emotions, right? These are not the emotions where, you know, you're, you're out there hunting and, you know, you can't find any food. So you, you get, you get frustrated, right? That's right. about you and the natural world. These are all emotions that have to do with your interaction with, with, with others. Mm-hmm. And so it, it really says, they all say something about how you care about your position in, in the world, right? Mm-hmm. In the social world. Yeah, um, that's right. Mm-hmm. And is, is there a difference? I mean, did you, did you focus on those? I mean, are all emotions, I mean, related to our status as social beings? I mean, does it make mm-hmm. sense to categorize them separately from emotions that you would experience even on a desert island, right? You know, right. Right, the, we do, in economics, we always start with Robinson Crusoe. And you're <laughs> right. Deciding, you know, if you were doing a, a class on introduction to emotions, would you, yeah. would you start with Robinson Crusoe on the <laughs> island and then introduce Friday? And oh, now we get you know, jealousy and anger, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So I don't, I guess I didn't think of them initially as social primarily, but they are in some sense because emotions are ways of caring about things. Um, caring about our lives specifically. The things that give our lives meaning and importance mostly are other people. So it's no surprise that the emotions that we have, because they're related to how we care, are related to the things we care most about. Most of those things are other human beings. Um, So there is some sense in which uh, I think some of the emotions are not necessarily social exactly. So envy, for example, um, you know, look, uh, envy is about, on my view, it's about um, wanting something. You have a certain vision of what you want your life to be. There are certain things that go with that vision. um, And you're going to be paying when you see someone else enjoying something that you want. It's sort of social in the sense that usually it gives, usually you you feel envy when you see another person enjoying something that you have, that you want for your life. But it's also partially related to objects. If you think about envy as, you know, having to do sort of with material possessions, it doesn't, it's not exclusively about material possessions. Yeah, um, you probably so wouldn't want it if your neighbor didn't have it, right? <laughs> I mean, Oh, no, I mean, I think you would. I mean, I think there are certain things that I think you, you are, you're pained by your own loss of the thing when you see someone else having it, mm-hmm. when you see someone else enjoying it. But I don't think you want it only because your neighbor has it. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, getting to, to envy i mean yeah you can feel envy and and that's okay but if you go and key your neighbor's car right, right then then <laughs> right. then you know you've 
you've you've gone you've gone too far. That's right. right. Again, and an, another way of sort of doing something, right? If I if I go and destroy the object that's causing my pain, well, then maybe that's a way for me to get over my pain. Another way of being unwilling to just sort of feel the envy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you also imply that if if you don't if you if you manage to to master these things then that's sort of, uh, you didn't use this term, but it seems like a form of, of pride, right? Mm. Of, of mm -hmm. in, the, in the old fashioned sinful sense, because if, if you, as you said, if you experience schadenfreude, it's, it's usually bundled in with a, a sense that there, but for the grace of God, go I, right? right. You know, like mm -hmm. when you see someone, I think you used the example of someone, you know, walking into a, a glass door, I right. mean, and, and you, you know, kind of laugh at them and, and you yeah. feel, you know, bad about it but on the one hand it's like yeah if if you did it yourself hopefully you would laugh at yourself mm -hmm. to some degree yeah exactly right that's exactly right yeah now now shame seems a a little bit harder to 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 defend i mean shame is in, i think in the book you say that you know shame is we should rehabilitate shame shame is an emotion that is can be very beneficial but then there's shaming which is mm -hmm. kind of making someone uh, feel, feel shame. Mm -hmm. Is, is that, I mean, how can you feel, I mean, can, can you feel shame without other people shaming you? I mean, do you need the, uh, yeah. the, the engine of mm -hmm. social, or at least do you need to be able to imagine that you're being looked at from the position of other people in order mm -hmm. to experience this? Yeah, this is a there's a long standing debate in philosophy about whether they about whether sort of an audience is, is the way we tend to put it, whether an audience is necessary for shame. And this is like one of those really ancient sort of dividing lines among philosophers. Um, and I try to in the book, I kind of tried to th the first book, I try to sort of skirt the middle there because I think I think there's something right about both views. So so some people will say, no, 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 listen, you can totally imagine a case where somebody would feel shame about something that no no one else knows about that you've kept secret forever and you can be alone in your living room and just have this you know terrifying moment of shame about whatever it is that you that you're feeling right um whatever it is that you're ashamed about even if nobody knows it so yeah that seems right to me it also seems right to me that the the people who think an audience is necessary are going to say yeah but don't you have to have some kind of like, aren't you imagining yourself from someone else's perspective in feeling shame? Aren't you thinking to yourself, oh, what if I had gotten found out, even if it's a secret thing? Aren't you thinking, ah, oh, but what if somebody knew? And I think, so yeah, I think both of them, I think both of those cases are right. There's something right about both views. And so in, in the first book, what I try to do is say, well, listen, what's really necessary for shame is not so much that you have some actual other person who's kind of pointing the finger at you, but you do have to have some sense of how you might be viewed by somebody who's not you. Even if that's not a particular person, even if that's not an internalized other, whatever that means, it's it just you do have to have a sense, though, that someone else could see you in a way that you don't see yourself. So you have to have a kind of a perspective on yourself that's sort of external. Um, so that I don't think requires an actual audience. And oftentimes the flip side of that is. I don't think when we try to shame people, I don't actually think we're necessarily trying to make them feel shame all of the time. I think sometimes we use shaming for very different purposes. Whether that person feels shame or not is oftentimes beside the point of what we're actually trying to accomplish when we shame. So if you don't feel shame, does that mean that you don't, that you have, you disregard the opinions of others that you disregard the things that others might find important mm -hmm. is, is that is that the the problem with kind of shamelessness yeah that's exactly the problem with shamelessness it's a kind of i think of it as a kind of imperviousness to the way that other people might view you right and i think when we think about people who are shameless like a shameless flatterer or somebody like that or a shameless self-promoter Oftentimes when we're trying to articulate for ourselves, like what's wrong with that person? Why are, why do we find that person so objectionable or offensive? I think the reason we find them objectionable is because they've sort of think they're kind of Teflon Don, right? They're like untouchable by whatever someone else's views are. So no matter what I might think about them, they don't care what other people think about them. And I actually argue in the book that that's not a good trait to have. Like, hmm. It's not a good trait for you to be perfectly impervious to the views of other people. 
And and that's why I found contempt to be the, the hardest of the of the the bad feelings. You are to, not alone in that view. Lots of people have that. Have yeah, that because I mean that that seems to be a feeling that disregards the 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 humanity of others to some degree, right? And you know, there are all sorts of studies that show that when couples experience contempt, right? I don't again, I don't know if how solid these studies are, but that if you see contempt in a, in a relationship that predicts the failure of, of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how can we even defend contempt? Yeah, that's, I think we tend to get worried about contempt because we think of its worst versions. So it's, it's one of the emotions that is most subject to what I sometimes call the extreme cases problem. So when we think about contempt and the problems with contempt, it's because we're thinking about like the worst possible version of contempt, the contempt that people have, you know, for uh, people who's who have different races from them, the people who have contempt for, you know, when we when we dehumanize people, we have contempt. So I think that's one of the reasons it's really, really hard for people to get on board with contempt. But I think there is a more like average everyday version of contempt um, that is part of how we try to kind of gauge our own sense of self and our own sense of sort of self-confidence or not and that it's the more mild version that i think we're we're less familiar with we don't this think is a of du bois it. example right yeah this is the du bois example but also just anytime you are interacting with another person and you think oof well i'm not like that or at least i'm not like that or at least i'm not that bad that's a more mild version of contempt, I think. And I think some people don't want to talk about it in those terms because they want to save the word contempt for these like really serious, severe examples. But I just think it is part of what we're doing when we're thinking, well, at least I'm not like that. And so in other words, it's it's a yeah. it's a necessary part of of aspiration in, in exactly. some way. Right. Yeah. Like if you if you aspire to a virtue, mm -hmm. well, you have to consequently view the absence of that virtue in, in some negative way, right? Well, and it's also, I think, a form of our um, developing self-confidence. Like, where does self-confidence come from? Does it hatch from an egg? Does it drop from the sky? No. It's something that we have to sort of build, and we partially build it through kind of getting to know ourselves and our mm. own self-discovery. So that's what, I think that's what Du Bois is, is so the, the story that Du Bois tells in The Souls of Black Folk is um, he, he starts to have contempt for his white class classmates when he kind of sees that he does better than them on tests and he can outrun them in a foot race and he can beat them up when they get into physical fights and he starts to sort of convince himself that oh I'm better than all of them mm -hmm. um, it's a way he uses it as a way of sort of protecting himself against a kind of racial animus that he experiences but I think that's what we're doing in these cases when we kind of start comparing ourselves to other people and we start going like well, you know, I'm not, I might not be the best parent in the world, but at least I'm not doing that thing that those other rotten parents are doing. Um, we have to kind of judge and compare and contrast ourselves to other people to figure out how we're doing. Mm. There's not some magic stone tablet that's going to give you the objective answer of sort of like how you're stacking up. That's something you have to do in real time with other people in the social world. And you're going to end up sort of having these feelings of going, well, uh, this sort of self-assuredness that comes along with contempt of going, well, at least I'm not that bad. Mm. I may not be the best, but I'm not that bad. That's just part of what it means to, I think, develop self-confidence. Yeah. Well, one of the defining principles of um, the Haas Business School where I teach is confidence without attitude. <laughs> and I, I guess what you're saying is well, that's kind of impossible. Like maybe right. you could say <laughs> confidence without too much attitude. <laughs> right, exactly. I think you know, that's probably it's an a better inevitable, way of it. <laughs> it's an inevitable part of, of confidence. There has yeah. to be a little bit of attitude, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, spite is another one. I mean, this one's this one's uh, also kind of hard to defend. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's easy, It's actually easy to understand. I mean, totally. I, think, I think when it comes to understanding these emotions, that job is easier to do than, than, than justifying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all know why people will, you know, cut the, their nose off to, you know, spite their face or whatever, you know, whatever the phrase. Right, right. I mean, you mentioned, I'm Irish like, like you, and, and there's all these jokes about, you know, when, when your house burns down and you get a wish, you know, your wish is to burn your neighbor's house down <laughs> twice, right. Or whatever. <laughs> right. 
Um, but I mean, that, that's a joke because we, we see that as a, as a, as a mm. terrible uh, characteristic. Mm. I mean, how, how can you justify, justify spite? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, again, yeah, spite is a, is a tough one, I think, for people. But I think it makes more sense when you think about it as um, trying to kind of put up barriers between you and other people in terms of what they're trying to lord over you. So it's, I think it's much less common for us to spite people just, you know, who we don't know for absolutely no reason. We have more of a tendency to spite people when we think of them as trying to kind of butt into our business or trying to lord themselves over us. Now, spite is one of the emotions that really you can see the difference between how you experience the world and how the world actually is. Because there's plenty of times where you might feel spiteful towards someone because you perceive them as lording themselves over you, uh, but actually they're not. So I am, I will say absolutely the subject of this. I think any academic has kind of had this experience of interacting with somebody who's not an academic. And the minute they find out you have a PhD, there are certain people who really react to that in a way that feels like, whoa, man, I wasn't even saying anything to you. Like, I'm just here living my life, being a person. But there's a lot of people who think like the mere fact that you have a PhD means you are constantly lording yourself over people, (laughs) even if you don't think like, I wasn't saying. Um, family family think, and friends in particular. Family and friends <laughs> like, in particular. You're like, oh, hey, and, did you know, don't lecture me. <laughs> the, don't lecture. Oh, the doctor. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Um, so so that's a place where where you can see like, oh, look, the perception in the individual case, the perception may not match, you know, the experience of, of um, the experience of the world may not match how the world actually is. But to that point, there is a way that somebody in that situation, you know, their spite might not be really responding to the actual interaction they're having with me, but it might be responding to something nonetheless, because there is a sort of, you can, you can see examples of kind of the educated class in general, even if I am not necessarily doing that in any particular situation, the educated class in general does sometimes have a tendency to sort of lord themselves over other people to sort of swoop in and say, I know what it, we're, I know what's going on here and here's what we should be all talking about. And they're very judgmental. Um, so we have a little bit of a history of that. It's not as though that criticism doesn't land. So somebody's spite might not necessarily be sort of, it might not be accurate in a particular situation, but it might not be so inaccurate if we're thinking about how we all exist together in a social world as part of our sort of social roles. So, so that's one of some the comfort- difficult things about that. So Go there ahead. might be some confirmation bias, you know, going on in, yeah. in all of these that's fair. Uh, situations. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also referenced the the back of the shop. And, you know, I, yeah. I'm like you, I'm a big fan of Montaigne and, yeah. you know, I read quite a bit of them, you know, but Absolutely. I don't remember this. <laughs> to, oh, you don't remember this? Oh, yeah, this is a good one. This where is, is this one. from? I don't remember this back of the shop. Yeah, I can't remember the title of the essay. It's on, oh, it's um on Solitude. It's in the hmm. essay on Solitude. Yeah, and so he, uh, the back of the shop metaphor is, is sort of his way. It's not so much about spite, but it's more about... Um, uh, being able to have a place where you can psychologically sort of retreat from all of the things that are happening and all of the demands that people are like making. Like your tower. You, you your go life. to the tower, yeah, the library. You go to your tower, right? Your chateau library, right? Um, that's exactly right. And I think of spite as sort of playing a role in keeping the room at the back of the shop. So one of the things that people think spite is so irrational. Uh, One of the reasons people think it's irrational is because you will do something, oftentimes out of spite, you'll do something that's kind of harmful to yourself or at least not in your best interest just to spite somebody else. So like my, you know, my favorite example is, look, if somebody starts wagging their finger at me about eating healthy, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and order the dessert out of spite just because, you know, uh, and is that the healthy choice to make? No, but it's the spiteful choice to make and I will make it. Um, part of the reason I will make it is even though I know it's not the healthy choice, in part, the reason that I know the choice is mine is because I'm acting contrary to the fact that it's the healthy choice. So I can act in against, against my own self-interest, and in weird ways, that's an act of freedom. It's, it's like a the way underground of thinking, man, right? Yeah, it's, it's like... kind of like the underground man, right? And it's at least I know the choice was really mine. 
And that's what matters to me, that my life is sort of mine to live and that other people don't get to boss me around. So what Montaigne gives us is this idea that psychologically, we want to kind of maintain a space that's really fully ours. And the room at the back of the shop is that thing. It's the it's the space that's really mine where I don't let anybody else in. And I know that if I go there, the thoughts that I'm having are sort of really my thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not doing things for other people and I'm not thinking other things because other people are telling me to think. And so I think there's a way that spite is kind of the emotional equivalent of the room at the back of the shop. Now, Montaigne was, I think maybe you could describe him as a, Epicurean to, to some degree. In some ways. Mm-hmm. And um, you, you mentioned this new movement, like these new Stoics, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you're, you're, you're critical of them, yeah. but um, not just because you're critical of Stoicism in general, because you also say that Epictetus would be kind of horrified by what, what, he, what he's I saying. I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, what, what makes the new Stoics even worse <laughs> than the, the, the old uh, Stoics? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, is it makes sense? To, is your is your view of things say more in line with the 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 Epicureans? Why why can't we re- rehabilitate them to to some degree? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, so the New Stoics, I think. Um, oftentimes, what they want is they want the benefits of Stoicism without the hard work of Stoicism, and that's that's kind of one of the reasons that I think I'm sort of critical of the of the movement. Um, because they they want sort of uh, what people want more than anything is a kind of inner peace, and they they want this way of uh, dealing with any possible obstacle that might come up. Um, a lot of times, it's just a code word for. Uh, a sort of hyper productivity. Um, so it's it's combined. It's really popular in the business mm-hmm. world, I think, these days for that reason. So you have these like high powered CEOs who, you know, have constant demands on their time and, you know, feel like their their lives are sort of swallowed by work. And I think the thing that attracts them to stoicism is it's a way of having a kind of inner mental sanctuary where nothing touches you. Um, in the midst of this sort of chaos. And in some ways, that's not an inaccurate description of what the original Stoicism was kind of about. Um, There were lots of Stoics who were themselves involved in extremely difficult, for example, political situations. Seneca was one of them, who probably needed something like an inner mental, mental sanctuary because his life was chaos sort of on the outside of that. Um, but mostly it's just a way of I think sort of retreating into um, it's a way of exercising control over a situation that in some ways you, you you can't have that kind of control over life. Life doesn't really work that way. And so I think it's just a kind of like it's a form of wishful thinking mm-hmm. to think that if I just have if I just have perfect inner mental peace, then, you know, that's that's going to solve all of my problems for me. Um, and I just think that's kind of a denial of how life actually works. Um, uh, but uh, I actually think of Montaigne more as a skeptic than I do an mm-hmm. Epicurean. Now, he de- he definitely had Epicurean tendencies, at least insofar as he loved life, right, and wanted to be, and, and saw life as kind of, like, joyous and, and really enjoyed all the things, you know, kind of th- that his that his life brought him. Um, but he's much more of a, I think of him much more as a skeptic in the sense that his, he tries very hard to be nimble in his thinking. He tries very hard to not come down too hard on one side or the other of something, and he wants to have enough kind of intellectual humility. And funny enough, spite is involved in his kind of intellectual humility. He has this great line where he says, um, you make me doubt things probable when you present them to me as undoubtable, right? It's this kind of, you know, if you present something to me as though I'm not allowed to question it, the first thing I'm going to do is question it um, right. because I don't like, I, I want, I want the sort of, I want the intellectual, I want the intellectual humility. But, I mean, the Epicureans also wanted kind of tranquility to some yeah. degree, right? And freedom Absolutely. from, from anxiety. I That's mean, right. is there, is there a place where, you, you know, you can have too many worms, right? <laughs> or the, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe, or do some of these worms turn into I don't know yeah. scorpions and, and and beetles? Right. I mean, <laughs> at what point does the the metaphor yeah. start to, mm-hmm. to to break down? Yeah, I mean, I think there are. I think when people get to the point where their negative emotions are sort of um, impeding their flourishing, right? So we don't necessarily want anything to impede anybody's flourishing. Uh, then maybe we have a problem. But the question I think I want to ask is, um, who's the culprit? Is it the emotion that's the culprit 
Or is there something else going on mm. there? So I, my guess is if you've known angry people in your life, and if you've known, like, let's say, envious people in your life, my suspicion is there's something else going on with them besides just their emotional suite. There's something else happening there. Most of the time, it's that they have some other, I'm going to say, damaged part of themselves. And I think what's actually happening is their tendency to feel more negative emotions is not so much the cause, but rather the symptom. Mm -hmm. So listen, if you're an angry person because you constantly feel like the world is mistreating you, your anger is doing the job that it normally does. It's coming to your self-defense. But the reason it's doing that is because you think of yourself as constantly under attack. Well, the question you might ask yourself is, why do I think of myself as constantly under attack? Am I seeing the world in a certain way? Am I experiencing the world in a certain way that actually I need to rethink this? Like, am I really a person who's constantly under attack? Is the world out to get me? And maybe it's that sense that's causing all of the angry feelings rather than I think the other way around. I think we tend to think of the explanation as, oh, you felt too much anger and it's made you an angry person. But I think it's usually the opposite. There's something about your sense of self that's making anger come to your defense all of the time now, i think you you channel nietzsche and when you say that the you know the the opposite of life isn't death but it's 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 nihilism yeah. and and so you know do you think that we run the danger of of nihilism if we manage our emotions too too tightly i mean mm -hmm. is that inevitably drive out our love of life right? mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think we it's a price we pay a price for the kind of control that I think we often want. When we are trying to master our emotions, I think that's oftentimes what we're looking for. We're looking for uh safety and we're looking for security and we're looking for uh, inner peace. And we're looking for a life that is, you know, f as they say frictionless and stress-free and and all that. But I think we what it what kind of life do we end up with if it's a kind of life where we are uh we have absolutely everything under our thumbs and nothing escapes sort of the boundaries of our will like what have we done what sort of life is that like is life in the comfortable easy chair a life worth having even if it never comes with any pain and so what would emotional education look like, right? I mean, does, does it make sense to talk about? I mean, because I don't think you're advocating that you just sort of lay back and, you know, let emotions kind of, you know, wash <laughs> over you, right? I mean, there is, you, you do yeah. have this idea of mm -hmm. maturity and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I don't think you completely reject the idea of, of cultivation. So what right. would it mean to have a, an emotional education, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we need to kind of, feed our worms, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> make sure they have, you know, healthy soil and, you know, yeah. put some, put some leaves, down, leaf down there. I mean, how, how do we, how do we make sure that our, our, our garden is, is, is healthy? Yeah. Nietzsche has this great metaphor of um, the, the sailor who explores his inland sea, not in order to conquer it, but in order to map it, in order to understand it. Um, and I think that's, if I'm, if I'm advocating for emotional education, I'm going to advocate for uh, a kind of exploratory attitude, one that doesn't treat your emotions as something to immediately be afraid of when you experience them, but rather something to explore, something to try to understand. Um, uh, I like to use the metaphor of friendship rather than control. So Lisa Feldman Barrett is this, as a psychologist, has this fantastic, I love her term, it's um, emotional granularity. And so she advocates for, it's it's a little bit like having a very sophisticated sense of color. So if you have a kind of simplistic sense of color, you might be able to say, ah, red, blue, green, right? But if you have a sophisticated sense of color, you're able to look at all of the different shades of red and you say, ah, vermilion, ah, maroon, ah, burgundy, right? So you don't just see red, you see all of the different kinds of red. And I think that's a great way of thinking about emotional granularity, thinking about all of the different shades of anger that you have. And rather than trying to immediately shove them to the side, trying to think, okay, what am I feeling right now? What's going on? 
Um, let me go ahead and say out loud that I'm feeling that mm -hmm. thing. That makes people really squirm. If you have ever had to say out loud, I feel envy, and then just stop, not say anything else, not try to justify it or chase it away, that actually makes people squirm most of the time. But I think that's good. I think that's a good experience to have. So something a little bit more like, let's get to know all of our emotions. Let's figure out what role they're playing. Let's figure out what their insights are. Let's have a kind of curiosity toward them rather than having a mode of control. Yeah, I would probably use the metaphor of the palate because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I like to cook and, you know, I like sweet and sour and bitter and spicy. And when I hear about Mahatma Gandhi's diet, I, I feel like I don't think I could, <laughs> I, I, it sounds like prison. I mean, it's just like, who would want to eat bologna sandwiches every day? It just sounds terrible, right? I'd much, right. much rather have my lips burnt by some something that's too spicy and have my face get twisted up by something too too sour and, you know, every now and then. Yeah, but um. Absolutely. But, I do have one last question, which is yeah. there's this character that pops up in the book over and over again, which is your your least favorite coworker. <laughs> now, I just want to know, like, is this a real person? <laughs> and if it, if it works at Swarthmore, because if, they, if it is, I'm sure this person is probably not too happy to be in, in your book and it all is, the time. It is not a person who works at Swarthmore. I will say that. No. No, um, it is. It's mostly a construction, but maybe a construction that has some basis in reality. <laughs> okay, well, we'll just leave it at that. We'll and, just leave uh, it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you to uh, tell me who it is. Um, Krista, thanks so much for joining me. It's a fun book. I re really enjoyed it. Uh, not just a fun book, but also a really um, thoughtful book. And uh, it certainly made me uh, rethink my view of emotions. Um, and I'm going to definitely try to be less saintly uh, <laughs> going forward. The book's called uh, Dancing with the Devil, Why Bad Feelings Make Life Good. We'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Cat, because it's Zoom. So <laughs> Cut. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. i have to hit the stop button. Okay, great. All right. Great. Thanks yeah. so much. No, I enjoyed it. And um, and keep up the good work and uh, look forward to the to the next book. Are you have, how's, What's the reception been for the book so far? It's been pretty good so far. It's been, I've heard from some philosophers. Uh, my my great fear was that philosophers would hate it and think that it mm -hmm. was not enough philosophy. Um, but so far, that's not been the reception. That's been good. I'm, I'm hoping it gets a little bit more sort of disseminated out there, right. you know, among among folks who are not necessarily academics. That's really, that was my hope is that it would reach kind of a wide, wide audience. I feel like it hasn't quite gotten there yet, but but I'm I'm hopeful. Do, do the, do the um, promotions uh, committees in, in philosophy departments uh, see this as, as good, bad, or neutral? I think they'd see it as good. It's with an academic press, even though it's a trade book. So I think that's, I think that's, I have that in my favor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And in econ economics departments, I don't think anybody cares. I mean, <laughs> it, might, it might even be negative. So, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. You have more than a thousand people read your book. You know, what are you, emeritus now? What's, who do you think you are? <laughs> oh, my God. That's terrible. <laughs> Right. It's the perverse structure. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. Well, uh, talk again. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. So Thanks so much. All right, bye. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.